the director of the Maine CDC. September 15th, 2021. I'll start with some epidemiological updates and then turn things over to Commissioner Lambrew to talk about some new advances and, and new data that we are releasing around school vaccination rates. And I begin my updates today on a series of unfortunate and sad notes. Maine CDC is reporting the deaths of seven additional Maine people with COVID-19. They include two residents of Hancock County, one resident of Kennebec County, one resident of Knox County, two residents of Penobscot County, and one resident of Waldo County. One was a woman and six were men. Two were in their 50s, three in their 60s, and two were in their 70s. These seven deaths bring the total number of deaths in Maine related to COVID-19 to now stand at 976. We'd like to take a moment to offer our deepest condolences to the friends, family members, and communities of all those who have died from COVID-19 throughout the pandemic. <clears throat> right now in the state, we have logged 81,955 cases of COVID-19 representing an increase of 778 cases since yesterday and an increase of 3,152 cases since we spoke one week ago. Cumulatively, 2,388 people have been in the hospital and our cases happen to include 5,839 healthcare workers. That represents an increase of 134 additional healthcare workers who have been diagnosed with COVID just in the past one week. Maine CDC continues to review positive cases of COVID-19 that are reported to us through electronic laboratory reporting. And as of right now, we have approximately 2,900 positive laboratory results that are awaiting review by Maine CDC epidemiologists. As I mentioned a moment ago, 2,388 people have been hospitalized since the beginning of the pandemic. And in the past 30 days alone, 166 people have been hospitalized. Right now in the state, there are 192 people who are hospitalized with COVID-19, 70 of whom are in the intensive care unit 42 of whom are on a ventilator. Sadly, that is the highest number of individuals that we've logged who are on a ventilator since the beginning of the pandemic. I know there's been a recent focus on the number of children who have been affected by COVID-19. And I wanted to touch on and add a few additional data points there, specifically with respect to children who have been hospitalized. Right now in the state, there are two children who are hospitalized with COVID-19. And over the past 30 days, five pediatric hospitalizations. Right now, thankfully, there are no children in intensive care units in Maine, but in the past 30 days, there has been one child who's been admitted to the intensive care unit with COVID-19. In total, based on data from yesterday, there have been a total of nine pediatric ICU hospitalizations across the state throughout the pandemic. <clears throat> Turning next to testing. Right now in Maine, our positivity rate stands at 6.06%, which sadly is the highest it's been since January 9th of this year. However, our testing volume continues to increase. Right now, Maine is conducting 477 PCR tests for every 100,000 people in the state. That's a 27.5% increase in PCR tests that are being done just over the past seven days alone. As we talked about one week ago, we acknowledge that testing has been a challenge. And getting a test has been a challenge from an access perspective. We're doing everything we can 
to build out more testing infrastructure across the state. And as I mentioned, we're starting to see those benefits reflected in our numbers. And finally, before I, uh, a couple of notes on vaccines. As of this morning, 900,614 people are fully vaccinated in the state of Maine. That translates to two out of every three people that you might meet on the streets, regardless of their age. Now of those 900,000, 2,258 have experienced a breakthrough case. To put that number in perspective, 99.75% of all fully vaccinated people in Maine have not experienced a breakthrough case. Statewide, vaccinations continue and we're increasing our rates there. Right now in the state, we are administering 2,406 doses on average every single day. That's a 20% increase in vaccine administration rates just over the past week alone. And finally, before I turn things over to Commissioner Lambrou, <clears throat> I'd like to take a moment to talk about where we are with respect to one question that's come into us and that I've seen on social media quite a bit. And that is where we stand with boosters for COVID-19 vaccine. Well, the bottom line there is that over the next week, all of us will be learning much more about the scientific data that surrounds boosters. There are a number of questions right now. For example, are the vaccines that we've all been taking and have been talking about still effective? Thankfully, the early data there continue to suggest that the answer to that question about whether vaccines remain effective is a resounding yes. Another question though, is our booster doses needed? And if so, for whom? This is in many ways the key question. Right now, there are four variables that surround this question around booster doses. The first question is for what age groups might boosters be indicated? Right now, the discussion is around boosters should be available to those either 16 and up or perhaps to a smaller subset of folks, say for example, those 65 and over. The second question is which vaccines are we talking about? Right now, the US FDA has only received an application from Pfizer to administer booster doses for their COVID-19 vaccine. Although we may see applications from Moderna and J&J, &J, right now, there are not yet sufficient data to help us answer these questions. The third question is with what time period since receipt of the second dose, should a booster be administered? The discussion right now is around whether that time period should be six months after you got your second dose, or perhaps something a bit longer, like eight months. And then the final question is whether folks who are in specific locations, like for example, nursing homes, or perhaps healthcare workers, whether they should receive boosters if one of the other criteria that I mentioned don't apply. From a process perspective, there are a couple of steps moving forward. Right now, we don't have answers to those questions. But over the next week, the US FDA and the US CDC's advisory committees will be, meet, meet, will be meeting to review the data as it currently stands. We'll have better senses on the answers to those questions and what they mean over the next seven or eight days. But here's what you need to know right now today. Although there's a lot of discussion and a lot of questions around boosters, boosters are not a medical emergency. They are important, but they are not the, pa the pathway out of the pandemic at this point. So what is the pathway out of the pandemic? Well, as much as boosters are in the news, our focus remains as much as on first doses as it does on third doses. First doses, primary vaccines, will be the way that we find ourselves out of the COVID tunnel. That's 
That's because you can't get a booster until you've had your first two doses. And that's why we are just as much focused on getting folks their first shot as we are their third shot. There will undoubtedly be more information coming out about boosters as these various federal advisory committees meet. And as they conduct their analysis and make recommendations to the US FDA and the US CDC, we'll be here to provide updates for everyone. I'd like to turn things over to Commissioner Lambert. Thank you, Director Shaw. Today, the Maine Department of Health and Human Services, in partnership with the Maine Department of Education, published COVID-19 vaccination rates for school staff, launching a new monthly public reporting system that will guide efforts to support vaccination. On average, 76% of Maine school staff were fully vaccinated against COVID-19 as of August 31st. This is with 85% of schools reporting. <clears throat> School staff vaccination rates range from 89% in Cumberland County to 61% in Waldo County. The vaccination rate dashboard reflects both school and central operations staff at pre-K through grade 12 schools in both public and private schools. By publishing these vaccination rates each month, we hope to boost school staff vaccination rates even further, curb the spread of COVID-19, and equip our school leaders with information to make the best decisions for their communities. I join Commissioner of Education, uh, Commissioner of Education, Pender Macon, in thanking school leadership for this reporting, as well as the steps that all of our school staff are taking to help protect the health and in-person learning of our students. And with that, Director Shaw, I'll turn it back over to you for questions. Great, thanks, Commissioner. Uh, the first question for the afternoon today goes to Megan from WMTW. Thank you, Dr. Shaw and Commissioner Lambrou for taking our questions. Dr. Shaw, if we could, I would want, want to go back to um, what you were talking about uh, with, with respect to children hospitalized with COVID. Um, I know that the, the vaccine obviously has yet to be approved for kids 12 and under or 12 to five, whatever kind of under 12 to five, whatever age range we're looking at here. Um, yet, you know, the, the numbers of, of kids getting COVID is going up. So what is the strategy when it comes to, or have you thought about a strategy when it comes to if and when the vaccine is approved and the rollout um, for kids in their pediatrician's office or the schools? So how do you think that will kind of play out? Thanks, Megan. You know, it's, it's of course too early to tell uh, because we don't have a sense of what age categories or even when any of the vaccines might get authorized for children. Uh, that being said, we're not just waiting for that news to drop out of the sky. We're already starting to think through the best ways that parents may want to take their kids in that 5 to 11 or even later brackets 2 through 4, where they would feel best and most comfortable getting vaccinated. Uh, we here in the state, as well as national uh, surveyors, have asked parents those questions. And I don't think it'll surprise anyone to learn that most parents would feel the most comfortable getting their kids vaccinated in their pediatrician's office. So we've been working with pediatricians and their professional society across the state to help them be ready if or when the US FDA provides authorization for those vaccines. Now, it won't just be pediatrician's offices. Indeed, because this may be happening around the same time when boosters are available. So we're also thinking through whether, you know, perhaps Grandma gets her booster at the same time that her grandchild gets the first dose. And whether some of the other available places in Maine, large and small, could be equipped to do both at the same time, as well as to tack on, as I think I need to, flu shots as well. So we're trying to see if there's a way to do that. A lot of this will depend on what that recommendation and authorization looks like and in what age categories it's applicable to. We haven't ruled anything out. We're gonna to try to be flexible as we have throughout the vaccine rollout. Thank you. Also, if I could follow up quickly, I know you just said that there are two children currently hospitalized with COVID five over the last few days. Um, as we know, uh, it's just, as you've said, kind of a snapshot of a moving train and generally Maine kind of follows a little bit 
uh, lags a little bit behind the national trend. And the national trend is that a lot more kids are getting sick. Should we expect that to happen here in Maine or is there some way we can kind of stem that? Well, uh, Megan, just to, to one note, it is, it is five in the last 30 days. Okay. Um, so j just so you know, um, and then you, you're, you're right. Um, epidemiologically, the virus has sort of started in the South or Southeast and then moved its way across the country. It's impossible to speculate what might happen. Uh, thankfully, what we've seen nationwide is that although COVID cases among younger kids are up nationwide, as well as in Maine, um, hospitalizations have gone up with that. But the intensity of the illness that kids have, that is to say the percentage of cases that require intensive care unit admissions in kids hasn't really gone up. That could change, of course. The best thing that parents who are worried about their kids can do right now is to create the safest space around them, to have everyone who the child interacts with be vaccinated as well as mask up. That's really the best way to keep kids safe. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Uh, let me go next to Patrick Whittle. Patrick, uh, welcome back. It's been a minute. Hey, thank you very much. I suppose it has. Um, so I'm looking at some of the some of the data about uh, school uh, school staff members, uh, and I noticed that there seems to be a somewhat similar kind of urban rural divide. Um, within the data as there is in the sort of immunization rates at, uh, at large. Um, like, for example, the, there's, the, there's the sort of the gap between somewhere like Cumberland that's close to 90% and Waldo that's close to 60. Whereas in, um, in, the, overall, in, the, in the overall population, Cumberland is around 85% and some of the rural, rural counties, again, are close to 60 um, what are some of the reasons for that dis that sort of delta, and what is the state doing to uh, to try to uh, remedy that? Sure, maybe I'll start, and Director Shaw, you can add that I don't think we're surprised that the vaccination rate of school staff is significantly different than that of the underlying communities and counties where they live, because we do find that there are these geographic patterns. We are continuing our effort, though, to support school staff to get vaccinated. As you'll recall, last March, we held special clinics throughout the state for our school staff. We, this fall, are offering pop-up clinics to any school that wants to bring a clinic to their site. And we continue to work with our superintendents and other school staff on educational information and other tactics to encourage vaccination among school staff. We are hoping this is our baseline and that each month we'll see that increase as we see our overall rates increase. But we do continue our work generally to identify those pockets of people who have lower vaccination rate, try to understand why and deploy in those circumstances those strategies that have proven effective elsewhere to get those people to get their shots. So, Patrick, I don't have anything else to add to that. Okay. Um, and you you talked quite a bit about uh, about, about about boosters uh, earlier earlier in the briefing, and that it's clearly um, kind of a. Kind of, kind of a wait and see approach. Um, is they going to do anything to get that information out to the out to the public? Because there seems to be like kind of a bit of a information gap in the public at large about whether boosters are needed right now and for whom. Yeah, I mean, Patrick, as you, as you noted, a lot of this depends upon the advisory committee's review and uh, how federal public health officials. Uh, adjust policy pursuant to that review. Uh, I wanted to talk about it today for the exact reason you mentioned. Uh, we've gotten a lot of questions from folks about whether they should get their booster on Monday morning and what happens if it's eight months and one day after their booster shot, are they okay? I think the bottom line that I just wanna underscore is three things. As more information becomes publicly available from our federal partners, we'll make sure we convey it and translate it to let people know in Maine what it means for them. But then number two, getting a booster, though it may be important, 
is not the same type of thing as getting your first shot was. That was a different time and a different place. That was, in some sense, a medical urgency. Boosters, based on the data that we've seen so far, are more in the category of like the flu shot, something you should do as, the, as we get into that season. And then the third, of course, recognizing that so many things will be changing as more and more data come out. I see. Um, one, uh, one final thing, um, if I could, there, there, you, this is again something that you touched on a little bit earlier, but there seems to be a little bit of a sort of a reporting lag in terms of the new caseload that we're seeing every day. So should we be prepared for these high numbers to sort of continue in the, in, in the days ahead? Because right now we're looking at daily caseloads that are in the neighborhood of 70% more than they were two weeks ago. So are, are we still on that same trajectory in the coming days and weeks? Yep. Uh, Patrick, the answer is yes. Based on every epidemiological factor we're seeing, um, I, I, we are anticipating seeing continued sustained high numbers of cases for at least the, the coming week, perhaps even longer than that. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yep. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, over to Patty White next. Thanks, Dr. Shaw and Commissioner Lambrew. I've got a few questions. Um, in terms of COVID cases in schools, how much is the transmission actually happening within school buildings? And where is it primarily happening? In lunchrooms or buses or classrooms? Yep. Um, thanks for raising that, Patty. Here's where we are and here's what we know right now. Given that it is early in the school year, many of the cases that are being detected uh, are ones that are primarily a function of community transmission. That is to say, kids who came into the school year, into the school building, already having COVID um, because of their various summer activities. That's really where we are right now. Uh, as we saw last school year, although there was some degree of transmission of COVID in the community, um, in the school, it was for the most part lower than the rate of transmission in the underlying community. Uh, we are, because of the, the changes that have been made, uh, the focus on things like ventilation, our expectation is that we will continue to see schools being a safe place. That is to say, not being a place where transmission consistently occurs. But right now, Patty, it is too early in the school year to go out with that conclusion. Right now, we're really seeing the follow-up of a lot of community transmission. It's too early to see whether we're then seeing secondary waves of transmission within the school. It's almost certain that they will happen. The question is whether they'll be happening at a rate greater than the background community. Okay. And many schools are saying that they're only seeing 20 to 30% of students sign up for pooled testing. If the take-up rate is that low, will pooled testing still be an effective tool? And what is the crunch in the buy next now test? How does that affect uh, pool testing? Great. Uh, let me start with the latter, Patty, because I think it was two weeks ago uh, where I expressed some concern about the availability of buy next now and um, the concern that it might impact pool testing. Thankfully, let me be clear, it has not. Uh, we have been able to furnish the schools that are participating in pooled testing with the Binax Now card test that they need to keep the pooled testing program afloat. Uh, it's been a challenge. I wanna thank a lot of folks at Maine DHHS, Maine CDC and DOE for making that happen. But thankfully, the pooled testing program has not been hamstrung. Um, in terms of the participation rate, you raise, you raise the right question and, and the right concern. Uh, if participation rates are not above, uh, if they're not as high as they could be, the utility of pooled testing does go down, but it doesn't go to zero. It still remains an effective way um, be, to, to get a sense of what's going on in schools uh, because you're getting a sample. Usually in epidemiological testing, uh, sampling is the best we get. We don't routinely test everyone in Maine to understand what's happening. We have a sample of people and that's how we extrapolate. The same holds true with pooled testing. But would it be preferable if 100% of those in the school building were being tested? No question about that. But the fact that it's in the 20s and 30s, although not ideal, doesn't render it un uh, unhelpful. 
Okay, great. One last quick question. Um, there are now two Senate Democratic leaders who've tested positive for COVID-19. Is the CDC investigating? I'm just wondering if this could turn into an outbreak and if the two cases already identified are connected epidemiologically. Yeah. Uh, Patty, you know, um, we just don't comment on individual cases in that manner. So I'm, unfortunately, I can't say anything more right now or okay. probably or in the future. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me go to Chris Costa next. Hi, Dr. Sean and Commissioner Lambert. Thanks for taking our questions today. Um, the first question I have is, is is probably for both of you. I'd be interested to hear both of your opinions. Um, and and it's sort of a two part question, so please bear with me. Um, just wondering uh, if there's any update from DHHS, the Office of uh, Family and Child Services, about uh, child care centers. If there's going to be any renewed guidance or new guidance coming out for them. Um, as we've talked about a lot recently, you know, those are kids who in, in some cases, if they're under the age of two, you know, can't wear a mask. Um, you know, obviously those kids in child care centers are usually too, are, they're too young to get vaccinated. Um, and as we've talked about, we've seen case rates at least climbing, even if they're not, even the kids are not going to the hospital. Um, has there been any discussion between family and child services, DHHS, CDC, about issuing some new guidance and, and do we know what that would look like for child care centers? Sure, I'll begin by saying we treat our child care providers as much like schools as possible. I mean, these are people who are caring for and teaching our youngest children. So we greatly value their work and their ability to keep children safe during this pandemic. The rate of outbreaks and cases in child care in Maine has been relatively low and we appreciate that work. We have in the same way that we recommend that school leaders adopt US CDC recommendations, had done the same with our child care providers. There are child care guidelines from the US CDC that we do recommend that our child care providers follow. Our Office of Child and Family Services provides that information as well as other updates to our child care providers on a periodic basis. We're also working with them to make sure that they know what their testing options are since pool testing is not quite as available to childcare as it is to schools given the structure of childcare. But we continue to work on a regular basis with our childcare providers, knowing that their children that they care for, like our school children, are not yet able to be vaccinated. Uh, I just wanted to add a kind of a second part to that question. I, I've heard from a lot of parents who have been um, kind of concerned about what their individual child care centers policies are around COVID. Do either of you have any recommendations for parents who um, are I, generally the trend has been they're wishing that the policies were a bit more strict um, in terms of, you know, how they mask, how they require staff to be vaccinated. Do you guys have any advice for parents on that front? I'll begin by saying we, we have moved to this phase where we are relying on our communities, our leaders, our employers to adopt these best practices as recommended by USCDC. I do think that we have an ability for our parents to be talking to their child care providers about these recommendations. It's easy to find the USCDC child care recommendations is a quick Google search. So we do urge parents to take a look at those guidance guidelines themselves so they understand them. Recognize that we are currently in all of our main counties in areas of substantial and high community transmission, which does suggest or recommend that people wear masks in indoor public settings, including childcare settings um, in those counties. So we do urge parents to be informed and to talk to their childcare providers about those recommendations, should there be a concern that they're not following them. And then Dr. Shah, I just wanted to clarify one last thing that, that you had mentioned. Um, you had talked about kind of the intensity uh, of the virus that we're seeing in, in kids and that it's it's not necessarily leading to more intense levels of, of, of treatment that's needed. Um, can you help kind of clarify for parents who, who are feeling a little bit confused about that? It, does that mean we need to take a different or maybe lesser precautions around kids? Or, I mean, I know that generally the, the idea is follow the US CDC guidance as it relates to, you know, things like schools. Can you help kind of provide some clarity for parents on that front? Sure thing, Chris. Let's first um, let's talk about what's going on and then what, what parents can do. There are two ways um, in which the Delta variant could be worse for all of us, including kids. 
Way number one is that it could be more contagious and just cause more people to get sick. Way number two is that when it gets people sick, the type of sickness that they experience could be a lot worse than the former one. With kids, it looks like the main impact of the Delta variant is really that first one. It just spreads from kid to kid or from person to person a heck of a lot more easily. And in so doing, it causes a lot more cases. But what it does not seem to do is make those kids who are unfortunate enough to get it, it doesn't necessarily make them sicker than with previous versions of the COVID-19 virus. That's a small but certain silver lining so far. What that means is that although there are more kids who nationwide are being hospitalized, the percentage of those kids who require, say, a stay in an intensive care unit hasn't changed from previous times in the pandemic. What can you do as a parent? Go back to what I mentioned a moment ago. The best thing you can do to protect your kid from Delta or COVID is really a lot of what you've been doing throughout the pandemic. To keep your kids safe, keep their environment safe. Try to have everyone around them be vaccinated. Try to have them be wearing masks if they're not with folks who are in their household, particularly when they're in an indoor public setting. And of course, if your child is 12 and over, we strongly recommend that they go get vaccinated. Thank you both. Yep, thanks, Chris. Uh, let me go to Eric Russell next. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, Commissioner Lambrew. I have two questions. Um, the first question I had is, I know there was a lot of talk um, prior to the um, implementation of the vaccine mandate for healthcare workers. Can you guys tell me if there's been any discussion, similar discussion about a mandate for educators, for teachers or school staff, um, and whether or not there's been any recent discussion or movement on that? And if so, why not? So as I mentioned earlier, we have been supporting schools to get their staff vaccinated from the start. We had those special clinics in March. We work with the Biden administration in March to prioritize school staff for vaccination. We have been offering special pop-up clinics to schools uh, throughout the summer and into the fall. And we are using the new data we just received to figure out where are we? Are there differentiations by region, by different grades, elementary school, middle school, high school, as well as differences between central staff or school staff, between public schools and private schools? These data are just coming in today. The reports were due last Friday. We appreciate the fact that 85% of all schools in Maine submitted those data. So we, we will be looking at this information, talking to our school leaders to see what additional actions we can take to get even more school staff vaccinated. Okay. So it's not off the table necessarily? We are seeing where we are in terms of our vaccination levels. We will take a look at this. Uh, President Biden did point to different states that have enacted vaccine requirements. We would have to look at our own authorities. But at this point in time, we are doing that baseline assessment. Where are we? And as I mentioned earlier, we're in pretty good shape overall. We have about 76% of our school staff who are vaccinated in some of our counties and some of our schools even higher. So we're doing a good hard assessment of those data, talking to our school leaders to figure out what our next steps are to improve that. Thank you. Uh, and Dr. Shaw, maybe you can answer this one. I know you have talked a fair amount about preparing for the Delta variant and we sort of knew it was coming and we predicted it and it came here. And so given that, how, why has it been so challenging to process the high volume of tests? Has it been more than you expected or are there other issues that we don't know about? Because it seems like the volume is high, but it's not necessarily as high as, or maybe it is you know, similar to what it was during the January and February surge. So what are the dynamics at play there? Yeah, no, thanks for that question, Eric. Um, you're, you're, you, you sort of went in that, right in that direction. Um, we, were we were prepared, we did start staffing up. Uh, we've added now dozens of additional individuals, about three dozen ind additional individuals who are focused on processing these, uh, bringing the total number now to about uh, uh, 145 or so. Um, but even then, we, in that respect, we didn't think that the onslaught of cases that we would be getting would be where we are right now. Uh, you know, in, in previous peaks back in say January, we were seeing on the order of approximately 400 
to 450 positive results per day. Uh, today alone, we had over 620. Um, so, you know, th this is this is a peak upon a peak, even greater than what we thought we were going to get. So we're continuing to add staff. Uh, we had a training session yesterday and Monday where we trained 10 additional individuals. We've got another uh, training session coming up soon. So we're going to keep moving additional folks onto this. It's a challenge for sure. Um, but Eric, what it, what it doesn't impact for the most part is how we think about COVID. Uh, that is to say hospitalizations remain one of the data points that we focus on. That tells us a lot of what's going on. Things like vaccination rates, positivity rates, those are all unaffected by this. And those are a lot of the data points that we really use to get a sense of the dynamics on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. Uh, let me go back to, uh, let me go to Emily at the Sun Journal next. Hi, good afternoon, both of you. So I wanted to go back to something that Patty asked earlier about transmission in schools. So I, I understand you say like, you know, it, it's just a week or two into the school year. It's, it's really too hard, too early to tell, um, but, have you or will you be looking at um, cases in schools and looking at whether or not the schools have required masks? Uh, certainly, Emily. Um, you know, as we as we think about outbreaks, as we get enough data, we look for correlations uh, to try to see which variables, which factors have some sort of association, and then ideally have some sort of predictive benefit. Uh, for public health purposes. We've done that in nursing homes, et cetera. Schools will be no different. We're always taking a retrospective look at any type of outbreak situation to see how it stacks up against others. Right now, this early, it's really, it's too early to tell whether variables like masking or vaccination rates, it's too early to tell exactly what degree of impact they have on things like case rates and outbreaks. Uh, we you got to we have to accumulate a lot more data to be able to run those regressions. Okay, thank you. And uh, my second question: I spoke to a pediatrician yesterday who said that over half of the new COVID cases that she saw were kids with runny noses. So parents came in, you know, they thought, oh, it's just allergies, but we'll get we'll get my kid check, uh, tested. And this pediatrician said that a lot of the school nurses she spoke to said that runny nose alone doesn't preclude a kid from school, um, even though runny noses are, are pretty common uh, in, for kids with COVID. So may, maybe this is a question for Commissioner Lambert as well. Is there any talk about um, maybe adjusting those pre-screening checklists that most schools require to include more symptoms that are that are more common in kids versus adults? I, I can start there, and Commissioner, by all means, if, if you've got um, additional uh, facts to add. The, um, Emily, we've, we've been, you know, uh, nationally, there's been, uh, as we've gotten more data around what COVID, in particular the Delta variant means, uh, we have a better sense of the symptomology, the symptoms that are most present when people have the Delta variant. Uh, earlier on in the variant surge, uh, we, we saw, for example, that runny noses were more common in adults. We're starting to see that in kids, although again, there too, we don't quite yet have a robust enough data set to really be able to say that the runny nose is the predominant or most common symptom. It may turn out to be that case, uh, but right now we don't quite have that. Uh, if that were to be the case, we would have to take a look at the pre-symptom or pre-arrival guidelines because as you note, runny noses are very common. Something that occurs commonly that can be caused by numerous different things, be it a, a seasonal cold, allergies, or COVID, we'll have to think about what a runny nose means and whether that should be pooled, for example, with a test before the kid comes to school, something of that nature. Um, we don't have any answers today because we don't have all the data in as a country, but that will be the decision tree, particularly with something as common as a symptom like runny nose. Okay, and I just wanted to, to follow up on that um, since the theme here seems to be advice for parents. Uh, you mentioned that runny nose seemed to be a little more common in adults with Delta, but generally speaking, like, you know, kids are going back to school. 
can can you kind of review like symptoms parents should be on the lookout for in kids? Has it changed from last year? You know, with Delta, um, you know, what kind of like a, a renewed look at of what people should be looking out for? Sure. Um, you know, the, the, the core symptoms that are of the most concern with kids remain similar to those in adults. That is to say, symptoms like cough, fever, shortness of breath, those are the symptoms that signal an acute illness, an illness where you may want to be consulting with your child's nurse practitioner, pediatrician, or other healthcare provider. But with COVID, we've seen that there can be a number of other symptoms, including things even in kids like runny noses, changes in the way that they taste, et cetera. The best thing to do in this situation is, and I'm taking this from a pediatrician friend uh, who indicated to me that parents often have a sense of when something is, um, is different for their child. Knowing your child and knowing whether the cough that they've got is the cough that they usually have in the morning, maybe related to dust in the house, or whether it's something that's different, the way it sounds, the how intense it is. Those are some of the things that parents are already well attuned to understanding with their kids and in an era of COVID will serve them really well. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, let me go to Mel Meyer next. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, and just uh, sticking a little bit on school still, you know, nearly 76% of school staff members are fully vaccinated, and that is higher than the state average. But knowing that schools are reporting so many cases and outbreaks, is this high enough? Well, I'll start, or Commissioner, go ahead. I mean, I think my, my bottom line is that any number of that doesn't have a one and two zeros after it's not high enough, but, uh, but Commissioner? I was going to say something very similar. We're always working to get as close to that 100% as possible. We will continue to look at this again to try to understand why, why not, and what will work. So that is our strategy as we speak. We're again engaging with our school leadership, all the different actors to try to figure out what else is needed to improve those rates where they are relatively low. And uh, we'll you know, again, continue to do what we've done throughout the pandemic where we've had a vaccine, which is try to continue to identify barriers and try to take them down. Um, my other question has to really do with the data. The state is updating uh, breakthrough cases on a weekly basis, but Northern Light is now regularly providing that data about how many fully vaccinated people are hospitalized in its system. Why isn't the state doing this every single day? Well, Mel, I, I think um, the, the algorithm and the intensity of what is entailed in determining when we have a, now Northern Light is only doing it for hospitalized inpatients. Uh, we do it for everyone in the state, irrespective of whether they are hospitalized or not. Uh, the purpose for which we do it is to get one of many epidemiological parameters to help us understand how the Delta variant is unfolding in Maine. Uh, we don't think that updating it more than that once per week adds to our understanding of where the Delta variant is and how it's unfolding. Keep in mind, Mel, every single request for data is a request that a team of epidemiologists at Maine CDC have to take on, and we have to calibrate that request with the hundreds of other requests for data that the commissioner and I may have. So we've got to make sure that we prioritize what is truly the most important for our understanding, the public's understanding, as well as for decision-making purposes. We think right now, weekly gets us there. And just to add to that, we do put a primacy on actionable data. So the dashboard that we announced today for school staff, I think is one of the few in the nation where we actually are going to be regularly putting up very detailed data so our schools and communities can act. Similarly, back in June, we started a monthly healthcare worker dashboard on vaccination rates by facility in Maine. Again, one of the few states in the nation that are doing that. Department of Education last week began posting school outbreaks they will be going forward, adding to that to provide more information on COVID-19 cases in schools because that type of information, which exceeds what other states are doing, is actionable information that people can use to begin to target where things are going well, where things aren't going well, 
so we can use the tools that we know work in those situations to reduce spread and improve outcomes. Mel, I just I want to put a sharper point on this. What Northern Light and other hospitals and healthcare systems are doing is different from tabulating breakthrough cases among positive cases of COVID-19. Uh, they're assessing which of their inpatients are not fully vaccinated. That's different from saying how many of the 3,152 cases in Maine in the last seven days had not full vaccination series, which of the vaccines they got, what the time period was. That's a completely different and inapposite analysis. Uh, I, let me oh, sorry. If I if I could just one last question, like you know, we are so many months now into this vaccine rollout, and some of these rates, um, especially when looking at the zip code tracker, have not so significantly changed. Have we missed out on the critical time to get people vaccinated? Mel, I think there's always time to get folks vaccinated, um, and I don't think we've missed out. Uh, Maine remains one of the most vaccinated states in the country. Um, so I don't think we've missed out on our window. I think the, the goal for us right now is to figure out of, of those who have not been vaccinated, what barriers are they facing to not be to getting vaccinated? And what factual questions do they have that if answered would get them to go get vaccinated? That's really the focus right now. Thank you. Uh, let me turn it over to Caitlin Andrews next. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I My first question, I just wanted to kind of circle back to something Patty asked as well and kind of just ask it a different way, um, which is, is the CDC investing any um, outbreaks connected to the state house at all? Outbreaks in, in, in connection with what? The state house. Uh, you know, there, there are two, Caitlin. I'm just not going to comment on individual cases there. Um, so I, I don't have any more to say about that. Okay. Um, second question is, it looks as though Maine's reproduction number is staying above one and we're among the highest transmission places in the country right now. How do you see this interacting with our high vaccination rates? And is this an indication that the state's current strategy, um, either on public health or um, in the economic side, needs to change? Well, let's first start with the reproductive rate. It, it remains one for the in, entire globe. Uh, there's not a, a place in the world where it's under a one right now, notwithstanding what some of the, the quick trackers uh, will, will, will say, it, you know, the, for almost every infectious disease uh, that's in an outbreak status, it, it remains above one. Um, so it, that's, that's the case here in Maine as well. Uh, there, there was a brief period last week where the rates were very high. Uh, Maine has now been supplanted, according to the US CDC, by West Virginia, South Carolina, a number of the mid-Atlantic states, which are now seeing the highest rates of growth. Uh, this is as much a function of the ways that the patterns of transmission change as the variants move through a population. Uh, as they do so, the patterns will modulate. There will be peaks, there will be troughs. Uh, I, that's, that's less indicative of things like economic policy and much more indicative of the way that the virus moves. Thank you. And my last question was about the booster program when it does or when they do become available. Does the state see itself kind of having like a a hand in managing how those are doled out? Is that just something that like um, the providers are going to manage? Like, you know, are you going to be putting out um, doses specifically meant for boosters? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sorry, uh, uh, could you just expand on that, Caitlin. Uh, doses, the, the, the doses for boosters as of right now are thought to be the same doses at, at the same dosage rate as are the primary series. So it won't be the case that there will be specific versions of the vaccine that will be for boosters. Uh, a primary series dose will be the same as a booster dose. Okay, so I guess what I'm wondering is like, is the state going to have any um, like management plan for those vaccines specifically? Or is it just going to be something where, you know, you go to your doctor or your provider and say, hey, I'm looking to get the booster um, and things like that? I think the available vaccination locations will be able to provide boosters as well as primary series shots. For some folks that may be their primary care provider Others, it may be their local pharmacy. For some folks, it may be going to the Auburn Mall 
or to the site in Sanford. Uh, I, I think that in the same manner that there were a number of options available for folks to get their primary doses, as there are today, those will be the same spots principally that folks will be able to get their boosters. I, I wanna underscore, Caitlin, because I, I think this may not be built into your question, but it's important. Boosters are, are not a medical emergency in the same way that getting your primary series was back mm -hmm. in January, February, or March. Uh, so the, the supposition that uh, the second boosters come out, you've got to be lined up at your doctor's office. Maybe for some folks who are immune compromised, who should already be getting their additional doses, that's the case. But for others, based on what we know right now, uh, boosters will not be the same type of urgency they were when you got your primary shots. Mm, thank you. Uh, let me go to Amy Brown next. Thank you, Dr. Shaw and Commissioner Lambrew. Uh, with 61%, I believe you said, of teachers in Waldo County being vaccinated, uh, are, how much are school outbreaks driving the high number of cases in that county where 52 cases were reported today as compared to just 10 in neighboring Hancock County? Um, I'll start, but Commissioner, please uh, feel free. Amy, I think, um, you know, the Commissioner noted this earlier, um, and it was, it was, um, a lot of what we're seeing with respect to school cases is right now a reflection of community transmission, uh, less of a more of a reflection and less of a, a contributor. Uh, they're certainly interconnected, of course, uh, but really, I think a lot of what we're seeing with the school outbreaks is that kids are coming back. Thankfully, schools are testing through pooled testing or other means, and we're detecting them. Right now, that's the assessment we've got. Uh, as we noted with some of the earlier questions, time will tell whether schools become drivers of new cases. Right now, really what we're seeing is the detection of those cases, Waldo County included. Okay, well, kind of keeping on that theme, we've heard from a healthcare provider who was told by a staff member at one of the schools in Waldo County where there's been an outbreak that people who were in very close proximity, like much closer than six feet with that person, with a person who became ill, tested positive. We're told that they don't need to be tested or isolate because they were wearing masks. And they're wondering how safe is that guidance given that people are wearing all kinds of different face coverings now, some of which have been demonstrated to not be effective in calling them masks. And Delta is so much more contagious. Uh, is that guidance still safe? Well, what, let's review what the guidance is, because in some cases it may be misapplied or misinterpreted. But the guidance from the U.S. CDC is that for students and students only, if there happens to be a close uh, an interaction, fewer than six feet, but both students were wearing masks and the entire school has a masking policy in place, if there happens to be an interaction where one student is positive, and everybody in the school, every student is wearing a mask, and that interaction would normally be considered a close contact. Everyone is wearing a mask. The person who is exposed, the student who is exposed, does not need to quarantine. But that's an exception to the de definition of a close contact uh, that the US CDC has put forth and that states like Maine have adopted. Uh, we think it's we think it's a smart one uh, because number one, it shows and underscores the importance of masks. Uh, you note that not all masks are created equal. That's true, uh, but masks still remain an exquisitely powerful tool to reduce transmission, provided everybody is wearing one, and that's why we've got that in place. We think similarly, Amy, that that's a great incentive for schools themselves to put in a masking policy because it means that if there happens to be that sort of close interaction, that close contact within a school classroom, the students need not quarantine. And the teachers, because this was regarding a staff member. This, this policy only applies to students, not staff members or teachers. So what would be the guidance for, a, uh, for staff members who have close contact with other staff members who test positive in a school setting? That would be the normal guidance for any other adult who is a close contact of a confirmed case. Okay, and if that is currently to isolate for a few days and get tested after three to five days, is it? Uh, it depends on their vaccination status, so on and so forth. It's a, 
a decision tree with a fair number of branches on it. But yep, it depends okay. on what their vaccination status is, so on and so forth. Oh. Um, so there's nothing specific uh, in that situation that's different from if it were a non-school exposure, for example, Amy. Okay, but basically they should not be just ignoring it and going right back to regular activities as if nothing, no contact had happened. No, I can't. I, I can't say that, Amy. I don't know what their vaccination status is. I, I, all I can tell you is that the guidance as for a normal adult would apply. Okay, so if I were fully vaccinated and I was wearing a mask and was in very close proximity to someone else who uh, tested positive, and I don't know if it's a factor or not that they were symptomatic, what would you be telling me as a fully vaccinated adult to do? Amy, I, I refer you to the guidance. I, it, 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 there's a lot of, there's questions there. It depends on when, and it, generally speaking in that situation, fully vaccinated individuals need not quarantine after an exposure, though they should get tested. Uh, but there too, this is spelled out in the US CDC guidance. That's really the, the gold standard. That, that's where I'd refer you. Okay. I think that's why a lot of people are confused about a lot of this. Um, another listener asks if the CDC or any other state entity entity is monitoring the number of businesses and municipal buildings across the state that are needing to close down because of sporadic COVID outbreaks and whether or not if you are, that's being taken into consideration. If there are any discussions, you mentioned that there are always sort of discussions going on it's to some extent about a possible new state of emergency. I don't know if that's more for Commissioner Lambrew or for you, Dr. Shah. I can uh, go ahead, Commissioner. Take this on and say, look, I, I appreciate that the guidance that now reflects the fact that people who are fully vaccinated may have different rules and people who are not is confusing. We get that. But we also want to recognize the fact that we want to keep businesses, schools, municipal buildings open. We want to be able to return to some level of engagement and normalcy safely, which is why the guidance may be more complicated, but it is enabling the main economy to grow, our kids to be back in person learning, as well as our different essential functions at the state level to continue. So it does it take more uh, work to understand it? Yes. Does it mean that some of us who are fully vaccinated have to wear masks in indoor public settings in these areas of high or moderate transmission? Yes, but it doesn't obviate the fact that Maine remains not only a state with the third highest vaccination rate fully vaccinated residents, but we also throughout the pandemic have been in the third spot for the number of infections per our population and the fourth spot in terms of the number of deaths. We have maintained that throughout this pandemic because we have adhered to these public health principles and guidance. We follow the science and I appreciate that it's harder. The black and white shut things down may be easier, but we are in this new world where there is a vaccine that can protect individuals. It can with significant community take up protect communities. So we'll trade a more complicated set of guidance for a set of circumstances that allow our children to be in schools and our businesses to stay open. Okay, we are seeing significant increase in hospitalizations and so forth though. So I just, you know, we're getting a lot of questions about exactly what are those guidelines. But my, my other, my question that I was just asking about is whether or not anyone is monitoring the number of business closures and municipal buildings that are being closed and whether or not that's being taken into consideration in any future actions. So we are, we are no longer in a state of civil emergency. We are not at the state level um, directing closures or tracking closures because that's not state policy. Um, given the fact that businesses, municipal buildings on their own may make decisions about whether or not they have the staff, have the capacity to be able to stay open with public health protocols, that's going to be a decision made at the local or private level. Okay, and just one last question. Can you say how many of the uh, 30 deaths that were reported in the last week here in Maine were among people who are unvaccinated and how many people died in the past week from vaccine side effects in Maine? Zero people died from vaccine side effects in Maine in the past week. So far as I'm aware, zero people have died from vaccine side effects in Maine, period. 
we can check on that as well as on the former number. Okay, uh, thank you. Let me go to Brian Sullivan to round us out for the afternoon. Actually, sorry, I, ju I just want to stop there for a second. Um, Amy, you've asked that question a couple of times, um, and it suggests that there is an ongoing concern with people dying from vaccine side effects. Uh, the answer is that we still need to keep in mind that the risk of COVID far outweighs the risks of vaccines, particularly when it comes to deaths. So there is not some ongoing underlying concern with people dying from the vaccines, particularly in light of the Delta variant. Right. I just, we get constant questions from people who are still concerned about the vaccine. So I just want to give you I an think opportunity it's a reasonable, to say that. Reasonable yeah. thing to say to folks that that is not where the concern is. Uh, let me go to Brian Sullivan next. Okay, Dr. Shaw, keep going there. Uh, we get the same kind of things that Amy does, that people call it uh, the vaccine a, a, a case study and that there hasn't been around for long enough for them to be to trust it. Uh, I think you've heard you say it before, but just can you talk to me about the development of this vaccine and why you feel it's safe and maybe just how long it's it's been around and why people should get it? Sure. Well, Brian, the, the technology upon which the mRNA, the Pfizer or Moderna vaccines, as well as the Johnson & Johnson vaccines, the technology, the platform that they are based on uh, has been around for about three decades now uh, and has been used in other vaccines that have been trialed. Uh, for example, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine technology has been used in other vaccines that are common. The vaccines fundamentally just contain a couple of things. For example, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines contain a small fat particle, uh, a substance called PEG that's been injected into people for decades, and a little bit of RNA. And that's really all they contain. They were tested in tens of thousands of people around the world who were monitored for a number of other potential side effects. Everything from some pain in their arm, all the way to Amy's question, all the way up to and including death from the vaccine. Uniformly, the vaccines were found to be safe, and not just safe, but effective. Since the vaccines have come out around the globe, at last count, there have been billions of doses. Or, oh, sorry, I should say, before I'll confirm this, Brian, but I'm, I, I can certainly say there have been hundreds of millions of doses of the vaccines that have been administered all around the world. And there, of course, have been side effects. Folks have had some pain in their arm. They've had some fatigue after they get their shot. But the side effects that we really get concerned about, so things like anaphylaxis, people having breathing problems, things of that sort, have thankfully been vanishingly rare and can be managed. The big question that everyone asks about is, well, you don't know what the future holds. You don't know what these vaccines are going to do to you in the long term. That's right, but in a sense that I don't think is helpful. Generally speaking, the side effects from vaccines that occur usually occur in the first couple of weeks after taking it. Side effects from vaccines, even these newer vaccines, don't occur months or years after taking them. And that's why for me and for my family, I felt extremely confident in recommending that they take the vaccines as soon as they were able to. Again, it comes down to the fundamental calculus of where we are. What's the bigger risk out there? Is it COVID or is it the vaccines? And right now, with people in the hospital, people still sadly dying, there's no question in my mind that the bigger risk is COVID and not the vaccine. So my question for folks who are watching, who are still on the fence, my questions come down to two things. What obstacles or barriers do you face right now in getting vaccinated? And what set of facts would convince you that today is the day to go get vaccinated? That, to me, Brian, is the exact conversation we should be having. Okay, and that is my last question here is, what is the next thing, and Commissioner Lambrou, feel free to hop in, what is the next thing to get those first doses in? You know, we've tried the get your shot contest and talking with doctors, talking with family. Is there a next rollout that the state's planning or anything we can point to to try and get more of those first doses? You know, I, I think for us, Brian, uh, we're focused, I think, on, on, on one thing, which is, answering these really granular questions. Every single day at the Maine CDC, pe people write in uh, to us on social media and other channels 
and we're really focused on getting sort of the person-to-person -person answers. Uh, if you've got earnest questions about the safety or effectiveness of the vaccines, we want to be able to provide answers. Uh, that's a lot of the questions and a lot of the work that we're doing right now. For example, recently there have been an uptick in questions around the impact of the vaccines on things like fertility. We've answered a lot of those and we want to keep doing that. In the lab, well, we, also okay. want, we, we also want not just our experts, our doctors, our nurses to answer those questions. We're hoping that our friends and family can answer those questions because oftentimes they're the trusted people, those who have gotten the COVID-19 vaccine, have not had the side effects, have not gotten ill, as well as sadly those who didn't get the vaccine, who now have been getting ill, who see the consequences in their families, in their communities. We think that we need all main people's help in this effort to explain both why the vaccine is safe and why not getting the vaccine puts yourself at risk of these, again, preventable illness. You can prevent being on a ventilator for the most part by getting a vaccine. You can prevent your loved ones from getting sick if they can't be vaccinated, their children are immunocompromised by getting a vaccine. So we do ask Maine people to help in this effort because oftentimes it really is that real world experience that will make a difference. Okay, yeah, doctor, I was just gonna say, if somebody's writing a letter to the Maine CDC uh, with a question, they're probably considering it, but the person who's not even considering writing a letter is probably also not considering getting a vaccine. So getting through to that person is, probably the biggest bridge to cross and I don't know uh, anything there or it's just we're going to deal with what we're going to deal with. First. Well, no, I mean, I don't, I don't want to be uh, I don't want to be um, shrug my shoulders and say, well, we can only you know, we, you're right, Brian, we've got to we, we've got to reach out to folks who are not reaching out to us. Uh, we, we've got a role to play there. Uh, certainly our colleagues in the media do um, and, and physicians uh, time and time again, a lot of data have shown that uh, that brief interaction you might have with your physician, nurse practitioner, or healthcare provider, if they mention, hey, if you haven't gotten your COVID shot, today's today, today's the day, uh, that this is part of the ongoing conversation uh, that we are going to be having, the media is going to be having, and of course, always with healthcare providers. Our goal there, Brian, even though it's just, it's so easy sometimes to say, gosh, those folks, you know, wh wh why haven't they been vaccinated yet? We're trying to remain respectful and open uh, as, as well as as we reach out to folks who are not quite there yet. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, we've, we've, we've spent a lot of time with folks this afternoon. So thank you to everyone who is still watching and joining us. Uh, Commissioner, I'll turn it over to you to round us out for the afternoon. So I would just remind people that in addition to vaccination, we are making that widely available. We are improving our access to testing here in the state of Maine. So hopefully those people who are struggling to get appointments will be able to get those appointments a little bit easier in the near future. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you all for your time. Apologies for whom we cut into the three o'clock hour, uh, but thank you all for your time today. Appreciate all the questions and discussion. We look forward to chatting with everyone next week. In the meantime, as always, be kind and take care of one another. We'll talk again soon.